Our message is coming out of the book of Mark. The book of Mark, chapter 6. If you have your Bibles, turn there with me. This is a familiar passage. Much loved, much preached. It is the account of Jesus walking on the water. As we look back, we will see it has been a busy day for Jesus and his disciples. They had ministered to the crowds all day long. Jesus had taught the word. And when the late afternoon came, he manifested his power and glory by feeding the multitudes with five loaves and two fishes. Now evening is approaching fast and Jesus sends his disciples away by boat to the other side of the lake. There are a couple of reasons why he sent them away at this time. Jesus had just fed the multitudes, 5,000 men we are told. If we count the women and children, probably 15 to 20,000. Messianic excitement is fever pitch. The crowds want to take him and make him the king right now. John tells us in his account that the people were so excited by the miracle of the bread and the fish that they tried to take Jesus and make him their king. However, it was neither the time nor the means whereby he would receive his kingdom. A throne awaited him, but there was a cross on the way. Jesus knew the time had not come for that, so he sent his men away to remove them from that kind of thinking. He did not want them to be caught up in the frenzy of the miracles. Another reason Jesus sent his disciples away was that he could spend some time alone with the Father. No doubt, he sensed the change in the direction of his ministry. He knew that the miracles and the popularity with the people would soon bring him in direct conflict with the religious leaders. He knew that intense persecution and eventually death was just around the corner. So much had happened. He was drained. He was tired. He was exhausted. The tempter had confronted him once more, trying to bring him, show him the easy way to secure the loyalty of the people. But he knew that the human proclamation was just the way of the devil. Salvation for men could only be bought and secured through his death and his resurrection. And he needed solitude to be with his father. He needed to confront with his Lord. He needed to be renewed and recharged. He needed to recover a clear perspective of his mission. He needed to be recharged with God's power and with singleness of heart so he can do the will of God. We should be people of prayer. Amen. We should be seeking the Lord's help at every step of the road in this life. And the third reason I believe he sent them away what to be to do with the disciples themselves. You see, in spite of all they had seen Jesus done, they were still filled with doubt and unbelief, as we will see. And Jesus used the storm to reveal his deity and his power to his disciples one more time. Now, usually when this mass, when this miracle is preached, we preachers tend to put the emphasis on the storms of life. Preachers love to preach the truth, to emphasize the truth that Jesus helps the hurting. This type of message always is well received because we live in a world of hurting people. And someone as well said, if you preach to hurting people, you will never lack for congregation. Yeah, because people are hurting. And they want to hear a message from God. How true that is. But while that is one possible application of this passage, I don't believe it is the one that it suggests. It is not the primary interpretation. That is why this morning I want to approach this, this passage from a different angle. As we look at these verses, I want to highlight some different applications that we can see here. I have titled the message, Revelations in the Storm. Revelations in the Storm. I believe there's a word here for the burdened and the brokenhearted. I believe there's a word here for the bride of Christ, the church. I believe here that there is also a word for the blinded. Not the, the physically blind, but the people who were blinded, them allow themselves to be blinded to the person and the power of Jesus Christ. So let us read the passage and let's see these revelations. Mark chapter 6, if you would turn that with me from verse 45. Verse 45. And straightway, straightway. Immediately, right away, he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida. 
while he sent the people away. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when evening was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed them by. And when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit, and they cried out. For they all saw him and were troubled. And immediately he talked with them and said unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And he went up into them, with, unto them into the ship. And the wind ceased, and they were so amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered. For they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their hearts were hardened. There is a great word of comfort here for those going through one of the storms of life. We have heard the saying, you are either in one of three places. Either you are coming out of a storm, you are going into a storm, ha, or you are in a storm. Amen? Storms come in many forms. There are physical storms, mental storms, emotional storms, spiritual storms. There are storms in our homes. There are storms in our marriages, storms in the workplace. Sometimes there are storms in the church. There are storms that rage publicly. There are storms that rage and manifest themselves in the quietness and the secret places of our hearts. Storms are part of our human existence. They touch every part of our lives. We all find ourselves in stormy places at times. And these verses offer some help. And hope for those of you who are passing through a stormy time in life. Notice with me in verse 45. Notice how he sent them. And straightway he constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida where he sent the people away. Jesus constrained his disciples. The word constrained means to drive or to force. No doubt they too were caught up in the frenzy of the miracles. They were excited. They did not want to go and Jesus literally pushed them into the boat and sent them away. Why? Did he know that there was a storm coming? If he is God, I believe he knew. Hallelujah. In fact, I suspect that he might have planned it just for this occasion. What you and I need to remember, church, today as we face our stormy times is that God stands behind every one of our storms. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I know some people have problems with that, but it gives me great comfort to know that. Why? Because if just one area of my life is outside of his control, then I'm in serious trouble. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If Satan, if the world, if my flesh can disrupt my life apart from the permission of God, then no area of my life is safe. Amen? But if no, if God is in control, and I believe he is, then whatever he brings into my life will always work out for my good and his glory. Hallelujah. We are told, and we know that all things, we know, we know, we are not guessing, we are not surmising, we are not hoping. We know that all things work for good together to them that love the Lord and are called to his purpose. Amen? Notice also how he saw them. And he saw them toiling and rowing for the wind was contrary unto them. They were on the sea in the middle of a dark stormy night. Jesus is miles away on top of a mountain praying for his, to his father. Yet the Bible tells us he saw them. Oh, hallelujah. He saw them. This verse shows us two great truths that we need to know about the Lord's care for us. Firstly, he is interested. Amen. Even though he was occupied with the matters of eternity, he was still interested in his disciples and what they were going through. He saw them toiling. The word literally means torture. They had been toiling for six to eight hours. They were in unbelievable stress as they labored against the sea. Even the wind was contrary. That word there means in your face. 
The wind was in their face. They were fighting for their very lives. And Jesus saw it all. Jesus knew their condition. He knew what they were facing. And he cared for them and for their safety. We believers have that same assurance when we go through the storms of life. We have a savior who is interested in our condition and in what we are facing in life. In fact, our Lord is moved by the storms that we are called to face. Hebrews tells us, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the, infir the feelings of our infirmities. Jesus cares about what you are facing. Casting all your cares upon him, for he Hear it for you. Amen. Hallelujah. And you can bring your impossible situation to him. And you can watch him handle it with his power. Hallelujah. He cares. He is interested in what you are going through. Not only is he inter interested. He intercedes. She, Jesus was in a mountain. But he was not wasting his time there. He was in prayer. Surely he was praying about the direction of his ministry. But I am also convinced that he was praying for the men down in the sea. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. You see, saint of God, you have not been abandoned in your storms. Amen. Hallelujah. The Lord himself is praying for you. Yeah. He is at the right hand of the Father. And he is interceding for you. He is at the right hand of the God making intercession for you. Hallelujah. The scripture tells us he ever live it to make intercession for us. And I cannot testify for you, but it comforts my heart to know that in heaven, the Lord is praying for me. Oh, praise the Lord. I covet the praises, the, the prayers of God's people, but it brings me more comfort to know that the Lord himself is praying for me. Oh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Notice also in verse 48 how he saved them. Jesus did not just send these men out there to die in the storm. And he didn't just watch from a safe distance while they were struggling. No, he took an active part in their rescue. Notice how the Lord Jesus ministered to his men on the storm. You see, first with his presence. They were not left to struggle alone. The Lord himself came to them, walking on the very waves that they were fighting against. He has promised he has promised that we can count on his presence as well. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Amen. I am with you always, even unto the end of the earth. Amen. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Yeah. Be not thou dismayed, for I am your God. Yeah. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. Oh, the Lord has promised us that his presence will be with us. Deuteronomy, and the Lord, he it is that go forward before you. He will be there with you. He will not fail you, neither will he forsake you. Fear not, be not dismayed. The Lord's presence is promised unto us. He has promised that he will be there to strengthen us and sustain us through all the storms of life. The storms are going to come, but you and I do not have to weather them alone. Hallelujah. We have a Savior who is interested and who is always ready to come to our side. Praise the Lord. Not only with his presence does he rescue them, he rescues them with his peace. When the disciples saw Jesus walking on the water, they thought they were seeing a ghost. Uh, the word spirit there is the word from which we get the English word phantom. They were terrified and they cried out, screamed out loud. And the verse said that Jesus appeared as though he was walked past them. It seems that Jesus got right up to the, on the parallel with the boat and he was walking along as they were fighting. Mm, hallelujah. These men thought that they were dead men. They probably thought this was the dead angel. But then he said to them, be of good cheer, it is I. Be of good cheer, it is I. You see, the I there is an emphatic personal pronoun. It is the same word he's used when he said, I am the bread of life. It is the same word he, said when he's, he used when he said, I am the door. 
I am the good shepherd. I am the, oh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He was saying to them, the great I am has just arrived on the scene. Why are you fearful? Hallelujah. The great I am is here. Then he commands them to stop being afraid. Stop being afraid. Why are you afraid? Stop being afraid. I am here. If only, if only they could have grasped who it was with them, they would have known that there was no reason to be afraid. And isn't it true that the storms of life at times terrify us? Isn't it true that often the Lord will come to us walking on the very waves that we are fearful of and we don't recognize him? Isn't it true that when we do acknowledge his presence, he is able to speak peace into our souls? Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I thank God for the many times he has come and spoken peace to me in one of my storms. Hallelujah. If only we can recognize, learn to recognize his presence while we're in the storm, we will have the peace that passes all understanding. Oh, give him praise, child of God. Oh, see also, see also how he saved them with his power. Jesus walks on the waves right up to the boat and he gets in. And when he does, the waves immediately cease. John tells us in his account that when Jesus got into the boat, immediately it arrived at the other side of the lake at their destination. What a miracle. One moment they are in the midst of a agency. The next moment they are at their destination, safe and sound. Oh, praise the Lord. That is the power of our Lord. Amen. If you are in a storm today, you need to know that the Lord can calm the waves. He can calm the winds. He can still your storm. He still has the power to do that. And on one hand, he might calm your, your, your storm. On the other, he might just leave you there. But you know what? He's going to calm your fears. Hallelujah. Either way, the storm ceases when we let him in and when he demonstrates his power. Praise the Lord. Oh, I give you praise, Father. You are always there with us. We thank you for your presence. Hallelujah. See also in these verses a revelation of the bride of Christ. While this miracle paints a picture, a clear picture of those enduring times of difficulty and pain, it also paints a picture of the bride of Christ as she waits for her bridegroom. His bride consists of every believer who have been saved since the day of Pentecost right up to the rapture. Amen. And I want to show you in these verses a brief picture of the bride. You see, if you are saved, you are part of the bride of Christ. You were placed into the bride of Christ when he saved you. Hallelujah. And just as these men were constrained and forced into the ship, every one of us who is part of the, of the bride of Christ was compelled to come to Jesus. You say, what are you talking about, bro? You see, none of us today are saved because we made a choice. We didn't choose to come to him. If you are saved today, it is because... He made a choice for you. Hallelujah. He chose you. If you are saved today, it is because he came to you in your dead and lost condition. You are saved because God drew you to his son. Praise the Lord. And when he came, when he called you, you came and he saved your soul. Oh, praise God. You are on the old ship of Zion because Jesus put you on board. Hallelujah. And I want to tell you, many of you, if you are not saved, there is room on the ship. Yeah. Hallelujah. There is plenty of room on the ship for you. If you have never been saved, you can come and find forgiveness, everlasting life in the Lord. There is room for you on the ship of Zion. Praise the Lord. So he saves his bride. Notice also how he sends his bride. Just like the disciples, he has started us on a journey. We are not headed to the other side of the lake. We are headed to heaven. Amen. Praise the Lord. We are headed to a home of peace. A place of rest and beauty that he is preparing there for us. And those of us who know the Lord. We don't belong in this world. We are just pilgrims and strangers. We are just passing through. 
Oh, praise the Lord. And this world, this world, this world stands against the bride of Christ. And sometimes the sea is going to get rough. Such is the case in our nation today. Amen? Everywhere you turn, Christianity is under attack. The world is not attacking Islam. They will react in, in violence. The world is not attacking the Buddhists. The Buddhists is no threat to the world. The world is not, the world is not attacking Hinduism. Hinduism doesn't pose any... Why? The world is attacking Christianity. The world reacts with hatred and slander and vicious attacks against the, the true beliefs of us Christ. Why? Because the world hates Jesus because his is a narrow way. The world hates Jesus because his is a narrow way. He teaches that there is one way to salvation and the world cannot and will not accept that. The world hates Jesus because his way is a holy way. And it rejects Christianity because Christianity demands a total break with sin. And the world will never accept that. And the bride of Christ can expect some very stormy seas in the days and years ahead. But I want you to see how he sustains his bride. Oh, our struggles do not go unnoticed. The Lord Jesus sees everything we face. And he sustains us through the stormy seas of life. Look at the provisions he has given us as we sail the sea. He has given us his prayers. The Lord intercedes for his people and he intercedes for his church. He died to redeem the church unto himself. And he stands by us in these dark and treacherous days. He has given us his presence. These are dark days for the church. The bride is under attack by those forces that would see her defeated and destroyed. And besides the attacks from the outside, there are problems within the church. Hallelujah. Today's church has been gripped by a horrible blight, a blight of apathy and complacency. We are living in the Laodicean age. Church members have become satisfied and set in their ways. They oppose any kind of change. Most of them are content to attend a Sunday morning service. And that once in a way. They rebel when you try to get them to do more. They are satisfied with the ways in which they are set. COVID came and the people stayed away. COVID left, people still stayed away. Oh, try to expand the ministry of the church and watch how these complacent, apathetic people will rise up and protest. Some will stop coming. Stop will, some will stop giving. All of them will murmur and complain. This is a sad commentary on the modern church, but it is true. But I am praising God. There is still a remnant that is looking for what the Lord wants to do. Hallelujah. And these people will not be disappointed. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there in their midst. Doesn't take a multitude church. If there is just a handful who long to see the Lord move in power and glory, he will meet them there and he will bless them with his presence. Oh, praise God. He saves them by his power. Jesus knows how to calm his church. He knows how to come and how to take them home. Hallelujah. He has the power to come for his church. And just as he came walking on the water to these men in that storm, one day Jesus is coming to deliver his church from the storm of this world. That is his promise. And that is our, is our hope. Jesus is coming. And it may get stormy in the sea at first, but he is coming. So look up, child of God. The Lord is soon going to appear to take us home with him. Amen. Hallelujah. He has the power to carry his church home. Jesus safely delivered the disciples to their intended destination. And the church can expect him to do the very same as he has promised. Amen. See, the world is not going to destroy his church. The devil is not going to destroy his church. The rebels on the inside are not going to destroy his church. Many a local church has been torn apart by, by bitterness and, and, and petty infighting. 
but the true church of God, the pride of Christ, will arrive safely in home one day. We will gather on the sea and in the front of his throne and we will praise him and we will worship him and we will give him thanks for his grace and his redemption and his deliverance. Oh, hallelujah, give him praise. The church is not going down, the church is going up. Oh, praise the Lord. The church is going up. I want you to see now the third revelation. And I believe this is what this miracle is really about. Jesus sent his men into the storm to give them a lesson in faith. He sent them out there so that they might come to understand who he really was. You see, in many ways, the disciples were blind to the power and the person of Jesus Christ. The same is true among many who profess to know him today. There are people who claim to be saved and love the Lord, but they have, they have no real understanding of who he is or what he's all about. And these verses teach us something to, to, to the blind as well. They are, there they are out there on the sea, terrified and fearing for their lives. All of a sudden, the Lord Jesus shows up and demonstrates his great power over nature. See with me, he is not bobbing up and down as the waves. He is not being tossed and fro as, as the, the, the boat is being. He is walking just as calmly and surely as if he was walking on a pavement. The Lord is walking up to them. Oh, praise the Lord. And he, is, he just stepped into the boat and the waves instantly, instantly ceased, ceased its raging. These men had all the evidence they needed to believe that Jesus was who he claimed to be. Yet they did not fully comprehend who Jesus was until he had died and was on a cross and was resurrected. And even without this miracle, they should have known who he was. Right. Amen. They had seen him, seen him cast out demons. They had seen him heal all manner of diseases. They had seen him raise a little child from the dead. They had seen him even as he used them to heal others. They had seen him feed thousands with, with, with a, child, a lunch of a, a little boy. And now they had seen him calm the storm. Jesus had given them every extensive, intensive lesson in his power and his ability but they never quite got it. And in spite of all they had seen him do, they still doubted his power and they doubted his ability to handle the next situation. It was just eight hours before they had witnessed and was part of the great miracle of Jesus multiplying the loaves and the fishes. They had collected 12 baskets of the remnants. And the fact that Mark seems to mention Mention the, the, the loaves, the miracle of the loaves seems to indicate they collected the baskets. What did they do with them? I want to believe as they got into the boat, the baskets were right there with them. The evidence of God's Jesus' power was right there with them. Yet, they were afraid and terrified. Now the waves have been calmed and the raging, seam has, uh, the raging storm has ceased. You would think that they would fall on their knees and worship to the one who can walk on water, who could calm the storms. Instead, the Bible tells us they are amazed and in wonder. The word in wonder there means a... <laughs> it was as if they were left with their mouths open, just wondering and amazing. Here is the Lord of glory who has walked on the sea and he has stepped into their boat and immediately the storm has ceased. And rather than worship him, Oh, as the Lord of glory that he is, they are in maze, they are amazed and in wonder. But we shouldn't be too hard on them. We are just as bad as they are, aren't we? After all, haven't we seen the Lord move in our lives in great power? If you are saved, you have been part of one of the greatest miracles that the Lord has ever done. If he has saved your soul and changed your life, doesn't it stand to reason that he can do anything? Yeah. Beyond that, hasn't he answered your prayers? Yeah. Hasn't he moved your mountains? Yeah. Hasn't he healed you? Yeah. Hasn't he provided for you? Yeah. Hasn't he blessed you beyond measure? Yeah. 
Hasn't he proven his power again and again? Hasn't he watched over your home? Hasn't he kept your marriage? Hasn't he blessed your children? Hasn't he kept you away from the accident? And when you were in the accident, did he not bring you out without hurt and damage? The Lord has been good. And we have all the evidence we need. Why then does it seem that we have so much trouble trusting him? Why does it seem that we have so much trouble just following wherever he wants to lead us? We truly are a people of little faith. And because of that, you know what, guess? Because of that, he is going to keep us in school just like he did these disciples. He's going to keep, us, keep on training us to trust him by faith until we learn that he is able. He did it with his disciples. God did it with Israel in Egypt at the Red Sea. Oh, hallelujah, at the bitter waters of Mara, in their hunger, in their thirst, and in so much anything, in their enemies. God did it with them, and Jesus is going to continue to do it with us until we learn our lessons. Because he is determined to bring us to a place of total trust, total obedience, and total dependence on him. He is determined to make us into the image of his own son. And the longer it takes for us to learn this truth, the more storms we are going to have to endure. Verse 20, 51 tells us that the disciples saw the miracle on the sea and they wondered. They marveled. They could not believe their eyes when they saw Jesus do what he did. But should they have been surprised? No, they shouldn't have been surprised. But Jesus, verse 52 tells us why. They couldn't believe the miracle because they didn't want to believe it. The scripture says they have hardened their hearts. The baskets of bread were probably right there with them. Just looking at it, they should have known of the Lord's power and his ability to save them. They had watched him take a lunch that was enough for a small child and use it to feed thousands. At that point, they should have been able to trust him for everything and anything. But they had hardened their hearts. And how many of us are better than they? How many of us have seen him do the impossible time again, and yet we still fail to trust him to take us wherever he wants us to be? We are just like those disciples, church. We have small faith, and our God is too small. And as long as what the Lord wants to do fits in our understanding of who he is, we are fine. But when he begins to stretch our faith... Uh, when he begins to do things we cannot understand, we pull back from him. That needs to stop. Hallelujah. And because of our small view of him, he is unable at times to do much with us. Oh, church, we can have a big God who moves in big ways, or we can have a little God who barely ever shows up, but we cannot have both. He is a big God and we need to understand that. He's a great God and we need to worship him as such. Amen. Hallelujah. You cannot have both. And as soon as they reach the shore, Jesus once again tries to remove all doubts from the minds of these men. As they watch the local people bring out their sick ones. These people have more faith than the disciples. They believe that if they can just touch the border of his garments, they will be healed. And many of them touch him and many of them are healed. And the Lord had used these disciples before to heal others. But here he is doing it himself. In spite of their being right there with him, he is doing it himself now. You see, he didn't need them. Jesus doesn't need the disciples. He chose to use them. The same is true for you and I. He does not need us. He just chooses to work through us. Oh, and what a blessing to be used of the Lord. And when we are walking with him in faith, as we should be, he's able to give us, he's able to use us in a great way. And when we are not walking with him in faith, he's not able to use us. And if he cannot use us, you know what? He's going to find somebody else who he can use. Let me bring this to a close now. Are you burdened today? Are you broken hearted? 
may I say to you, the Lord cares. He knows. He cares about what you're going through. And you can bring your storm to him and you can give him the give him, give it to him and let him work the peace in your hearts. Are you part of the bride of Jesus Christ? Then keep looking up, church, because Jesus is coming. And he's coming for you and I. And if you are not saved, I invite you to come to Jesus today. Let him change your life. Let him make you a part of his bride. Let him place you on the ship of Zion bound for heaven. Hallelujah. Maybe you are blinded to his power, to his person, to his potential, to what he is able to do. Maybe you've closed your heart and your mind to what the Lord wants to do in your life and in his church. And maybe this message has touched your spot, a spot in your heart today. If it did, it's not me. It's all him. He has sent this message especially for you. And if he has spoken to you, come to him. Let him in. If you are in a storm, invite him to come in. Open your hearts. Open your boat and let him come. He is willing, he is able, and he is ready to take you to your destination. All you have to do is give him a chance. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. The Lord praises. Thank you for listening. God bless you.